he saw a big gap between theory and practice, what you learn in the textbook and what happens in the real world. So he started thinking of ideas to kind of combine and bridge this gap. There are so many things I don't like at the same time, is that a lot of the people are looking to the short term, how to make money today, how to make money uh, for the next year, and they, very few people you know, know where they want to be in 10 years' time. You have the work environment that you need to operate in a certain format, and then during the weekends, you have a family party, and you see someone you had a huge fight with the, the previous day about something at work, and you need to manage that, and it's not an easy task. It's a very complicated task. I'm Farah Shamas. Welcome to Hotel Talk. We hope you enjoy listening to this friendly conversation between people connected by real life in hotels. Welcome back, everyone, to Hotel Talk. And today I have Yangos Hajiannis, who is the CEO of CIM Business School, here with us today. Now, we've met many times in various hotels, not just in St. Raphael. And I'm very honored to be part of um, CIM. I was honored by them last year. Uh, and they, and Janos will tell us all about that, all about his initiatives and everything that they do. So welcome. Thank you very much, Farah. It's a real pleasure to be with you today and hopefully, you know, having a nice conversation and people get to know more about us, but, you know, inspire a few people as well at the end of the day. So we're trying to get messages out, uh, whether, you know, business people or anyone interested in, in the business society. I think both of us are very active in this uh, environment, this ecosystem, and from uh, each each person from their own side, their own part, to contribute to uh, improving the conditions and making Cyprus a better place. Absolutely, in every in every aspect, in the business aspect, and the holistic aspect. So, um, why don't we start at the beginning and you tell us a little bit about you, where you grew up, like not just the business side. We want to know a bit about <laughs> yeah, you sure. and your family because it's a family yes. um, initiative as well. So tell us a little bit about about that. Correct. Uh, I grew up in Nicosia. Uh, the whole life I spent there. Uh, I've studied abroad. I've studied in the UK for six years. Uh, I grew up. Next, Whereabouts in the UK? Uh, I, my my first degree was at Nottingham. I did an LLB, a bachelor's in law. And then I spent two years at Cambridge doing two masters, one in, in law and one in management. And uh, I grew up around the business because CIM is a family business. It was founded by my father back in 1978. We're celebrating our 45th anniversary this year. It's amazing. Congratulations. And thank you. Thank you. And um, although many people, you know, join family businesses uh, out of need or because it's just the tradition, I personally feel that I joined because I love the business and I was always involved you know, from a young age, I was kind of uh, watching, uh, monitoring what was happening. I, I saw the prospect of, you know, having uh, education is not just a business. It's a, it's a very rewarding process because you help people to grow. You see the, the benefits of, uh, you know, adding something to, to their lives, to their careers, improving their lives, especially uh, our mission, which is to give a second chance for working professionals. So it's a very particular kind of higher education. It's not the typical, the classic type of higher education. So I was always uh, looking into the business and I, I was pretty confident that this is what I wanted to do. So let's rewind because there's a lot of people who will be listening to this who won't necessarily know CIM. So tell us, first of all, what does it stand for? Why did your dad start it? And what exactly... Yeah, yes. do you do? Uh, CIM stands for the Cyprus Institute of Marketing. It was founded, as I said, in 1978. Uh, you can imagine that marketing and management didn't exist as a science uh, back then in Cyprus. It was at the early stages of their development in the U.S. So uh, my father, I would say he was a pioneer, a visionary, because he, he saw that these are, you know, um, sciences that needed to be developed in Cyprus and the region. And the second thing that he was... Uh, you know, a pioneer about uh, and very innovative was the fact that he decided to set up an institution only for uh, professionals, an evening school. Uh, back then, there were no universities in Cyprus, even the, 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 Cy the University of Cyprus didn't exist back then. So he saw a gap in the market in terms of combining theory and practice. Uh, he, he studied in the UK. He saw, you know, how higher education was being developed in the UK. He saw, I mean, the, the good side of it. But at the same time, when he came back to, and started working for various positions, including the, the Central Bank of Cyprus, 
he saw a big gap between theory and practice, what you learn in the textbook and what happens in the real world. So he started thinking of ideas to kind of combine and bridge this gap. And that's where, you know, he founded this, this institution to serve a particular need. And I think we've been successful because we kept on, on a steady path and a very specialized path. We don't do a little bit of everything. Uh, nowadays, there are many providers here in Cyprus uh, at the university level. But what distinguishes us is the fact that for the fa- past 45 years, our founding pillars have been very, very constant in terms of giving the opportunity to working family people to study uh, through evening classes. We've changed a lot, obviously, and we grew a lot. But some fundamental uh, values and fundamental pillars remain constant. And you uh, stay true to your mission. Yes, it's not only uh, stay true to your to your mission. It's also uh, you know understanding what you are best at, and uh, you know believing in in your competencies, growing your. Com- I believe a lot in specialization. So I said I've joined the, the institution 15 years ago, and we've changed a lot. And people who are around us have you know they can see the change, but the change hasn't um, cha- hasn't modified the values. The values remain constant, whether we change premises or we grow the team or, we, of course, we introduce technology or we introduce new programs. They all have to add to the to the core strategy. I think that's where we've been successful, to grow the business, to, to improve the branding, to improve the infrastructure. But we, we remain constant and consistent and loyal to some fundamental uh, values that we all believe in. Mm-hmm. And also, you don't just offer marketing, do you? As well, you of have. Course, I mean, you've really expanded. And, and this, this is why we're no longer, uh, you know, called the Cypress of Marketing. We've uh, rebranded this year. We're changing our identity. We're the first institution in Cyprus to have official license from the government to be named the Business School. And now, our new branding that is coming out this this time of the year is the Cyprus Business School. So, CIM Cyprus Business School, which shows the you know the real picture of what we do because marketing. Uh, was the foundation. It was the beginning. But nowadays, it's a small part of our operations. We offer law. We're uh, launching this year the luxury hospitality management, which is, of course, uh, very current for Cyprus, which is trying to develop not only as a tourist destination, but actually to attract quality and to remove uh, issues like seasonality, improve the infrastructure of the tourism industry. So we want to contribute to that as well. Uh, accounting and finance, shipping. So we're an all-rounded business school, uh, but we still remain an evening school. We only deliver classes in the, in the English language because we want students to be mobile and global players. Uh, it would have been easier to deliver in Greek, but it would be confining our students only to the local market. We want global players and we live mm-hmm. in a globalized environment. So we believe- And your teachers come from all over, don't they? Your exactly, lecturers. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. We have uh, both local and foreign lecturers. The same happens with students. Our main focus is the local market, but we have more than 20 nationalities. Uh, they We don't in- actually recruit a lot from abroad, but we, we recruit from the local market, which as you know also that in the last 20, 30 years, the uh, Cyprus has become much more international in terms of uh, the people who live and work here. So we serve that market. And uh, we also have very good links with the region. Uh, so we're very proud of what we have achieved. And apart from the core business, which is the academic programs, whether it's a bachelor or a master's, we're also leaders in customized training and consulting, which is another side of what we do. We offer customized solutions for corporations, uh, for development purposes, for improving their staff, uh, uh, whether it's uh, short courses or even longer uh, executive education courses. Uh, I think it's great what you're doing. And um, I, mean, I think I told you before, I mean, for, for us and our family, my grandfather always raised us, raised his children. And in turn, then we were raised. The education is the most important thing. It's, um, it's the only thing my grandfather used to say that cannot be taken from you. Um, and coming from Lebanon and war-torn countries and in Cyprus as well. And we see so many refugees all over the world. But what's in your head will always be in your head. Where does your dad's drive for that come from? Because obviously you're, you're a highly educated family. You've been to some of the best universities in the world. But where did that understanding and that thirst for that knowledge come from? I think, I think you know, I, I fully agree that education is something they cannot take away from you. Uh, but at the same time, I'm becoming a bit more cynical because uh, to get a degree these days is much easier 
than it was 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so now it's it's more about you know the quality of the education. Mm -hmm. So education as a word for me no longer means a lot. You have to look into the quality of the education because there, as I said, you know there are many uh, providers, and also to to apply the education because. Uh, I, I unfortunately see a lot of uh, young children without any vision. Uh, they might get a very good degree, uh, but they, they, they don't have the, um, not only the stamina, but the will uh, to keep developing and learning and enriching their knowledge. Because we, we say, and it's true, that um, you know, once you are out of university, within five or six years, uh, if you don't keep up and you don't have you know, the notion of lifelong learning and keep learning and keep investing in yourself, it's not enough. It's a, it's a good foundation to have a degree, but you need to keep developing. And of course, you need to adapt to the realities of the world because coming out, I mean, I've studied in the UK, yes, a very good university, but coming back to Cyprus, a much smaller place, a, a place that things work in a different way, understanding how a family business works, how, how the, the environment, the external environment works, you know, teaches you a lot of lessons that the university can never teach you. So you need to combine this element of getting uh, quality education, applying it to the real world, changing on the way because you have to be agile and you have to be, you know, reflect, reflecting and also adapting to the, to the external environment. So I think, uh, yes, it's, it's a good starting point, but I see a lot of people who might have had the prerequisites through education, but they haven't developed themselves to the level that they should have uh, developed themselves. Mm. So I think it's a combination. That's where, you know, we have the executive education programs. That's where we have, um, whether it's the honorary fellowship that uh, you are part of, to keep networking, to keep interacting. Uh, and unfortunately, again, maybe the pandemic and the younger generations, uh, the networking and the understanding of the social skills, um, it, they don't prioritize it as they should. You know, to interact with people, you learn. To, so w why do you think that is the case? Because think, a lot of people do complain about the younger generations yes, being I, I think it, lethargic. It's, just, it's a lifestyle because, you know, technology, you know, comes with, you know, f from very early on. We were not raised with uh, mobile phones and internet. It came on the way. So we had to adapt to this uh, technological change. On the one hand, you know, the, the younger generations are, are very lucky to have everything at their fingertips. But at the same time, Someone can see the other side of things and say that they, you know, you don't go to the library, for example, to, to get books. You don't need them anymore. But that means that you're more isolated because you can get everything from your laptop. So you don't interact. I remember going to the library to photocopy. And this was not 50 years ago. This was 20 years ago. And there we would socialize with other people. And it was a meeting point with fellow students. We would discuss and, you know, solve case studies and, and, and network. So you need to find a balance. I mean, technology, having, you know, all these gadgets at your um, disposal is a, is a great thing. But at the same time, human interaction. And I think that, you know, COVID, uh, at least to my understanding, uh, has made us realize how important it is to be able to connect you know, physically, there are the tools to keep you going remotely as well. But this human interaction and this um, learning from one another, uh, it, it's hugely important. And at, at CIM, at least, we were thrilled to have the students back after two years of, you know, lockdowns, uh, problems, uh, because part of the essence of what we do in class, especially during the evenings, when the students come after work and they're tired, is to learn from one another, from their fellow peers, from their, uh, you know, shared experiences. So you're not only learning from your lecturer, but you learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And I think... Well, especially because they're all professionals, I guess, and yes, older. Yes, but even, even, even younger ones. I mean, mm -hmm. we have a lot of 18, 19, 20-year-olds who study next to a 50-year-old. And okay. this mix of learning from someone who is more experienced uh, and, you know, interacting with different uh, age groups and different backgrounds as well, whether it's socioeconomic, whether it's the, you know, the cultural. geographical, yeah, cultural. I think it's hugely important, and we 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 need to find our balance. I think that's that's where it comes to. I'm not the person who would say that you know, the younger generations are hopeless. No, the younger generations have a lot of drive. They have a lot of knowledge. They need to find a balance in in a, in a very complicated world mm. uh, where where you know. I see my kids growing up YouTube and my, my daughter is asking me, 
uh, hey, dad, can we go tomorrow to Chicago to buy something from a toy store? And she's 40 years old. And I say, when I was four years old, Chicago never heard the, the word. And now she, she thinks she can go tomorrow to Chicago and buy a toy from a toy store that she watches on YouTube. So things have changed a lot and you need to, you know, find this we balance. We need to be adaptable, yeah. And I think um, that's one of the... Um the beauties of education really and you touched on it just now a little bit in that it's not just what we learn it's applying our knowledge then to real life but n not as in the sense of okay I'm going to become a lawyer or I'm going to become a doctor and I'm going to learn how to cure this and then I'm going to apply it it's about being presented with problems and then having that thirst for knowledge to find out how do we find the solution and, and to grow and, and to, to grow growing, and, and keep and, growing and, you know, and developing back in the days uh, i mean you you studied accounting you became a chartered accountant no, no longer no longer is that i mean the norm now in big firms because we monitor the trends is to have different mindsets different mm. i mean you someone studies geography or history they become they can easily become chartered accountants they can become lawyers because you need people to work in teams with different mindsets. Well, to be fair, wasn't that was always happening everywhere else in the world, just not but, in Cyprus. Yeah, but it, it, yeah. it's changing even here. And, uh, you know... You <laughs> I hope so. No, but you, you <laughs> usually... I laugh because I studied classics. And when I was coming back here in between um, uni for holidays... You know, people would look at my dad and my parents and they'd be like, oh, she's doing classics. And then they'd tell them, well, they'd tell me directly, do you want to become a teacher or just get married straight away? <laughs> and, um, and I was like, it's a really difficult degree. And everybody from my year went on to become lawyers and accountants. Yeah, but, but yeah. Th that's the thing. I mean, in the team, I mean, we talk about teams, but, you know, you need different people from different backgrounds and that's what makes a successful team. Mm -hmm. If everybody's the same, then it's, it, it's not going to be uh, very, you know, creative or very uh you know promising. well then you don't need them if there's two people exactly. who always ag agree one is then disposable you need that yin and yang you need people to balance and create and exactly and challenge of and, and of course experience makes you wiser you know you learn through your mistakes uh you you know everybody makes mistakes everybody has uh failures and successes it's how you manage them but going back again to your dad, because you didn't quite yet answer that question. So where did your dad, because I mean, Cyprus was a completely different world back then. I mean, just having had that opportunity to go to England, you know, and his generation was already amazing. And, 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 and coming, coming back, back here. From, you know, after the invasion, you know. Absolutely. Let's not forget about that. I mean, 1978 was four years after the Turkish invasion. So it was like a divided island with so many uh, financial issues. I mean, I think he had a vision from the UK, obviously, when where, where he was studying. Um, he, he always liked lecturing. Mm. So he, he lectured. I, I and he has some great stories. He's, he he a is a personality. So. Yes. And uh, I think, and these are the people who change things. If you have a vision, I remember always he, he told me that, you know, this is saying that, you know, the future belongs to those who see possibilities before they become obvious. And I think... Growing up as a, as a kid, this is one of the you know That's a things nice I always saying, yeah. yeah. This is one of the things I always remember that if you want to be successful, you cannot be like everybody else. Not because you are superior, it's because you have this drive to look for opportunities, look for different things, being creative. Uh, sometimes it ha it it it, it uh, pays off. Sometimes it doesn't, and it, it's part of the game. Uh, but to be just in your comfort zone and never you know, uh, wanting more and being ambitious. You need to be ambitious in a good way because sometimes, you know, ambition is is interpreted in, in the wrong way. I mean, you need to be ambition, ambitious. You need to have a plan. And, uh, you know, it paid off because uh, we have an institution that has now 10,000 alumni and these are, you know, many, many success stories. And also you have to decide on the short cut or the long ter long term uh, game because, Unfortunately, I'm one of the things I don't like in Cyprus. There's so many things I like, but there are so many things I don't like at the same time. Is that a lot of the people are looking into the short term, how to make money today, how to make money uh, for the next year, and they very few people, have, you know, know where they want to be in ten years' time. I think I I always wanted and I always knew where I want to be in twenty years' time, and thank God, I mean, I have my health and my family and. 15 years down the line, I think I've accomplished most of the things I wanted to accomplish. But uh, I, I didn't take the easy road because 
in our field as well, as I said from the beginning, there are many providers of different qualities, like in, in most sectors. We could have made much easier money by going into other roads and other pathways, uh, but we stuck to what we know best. We stuck to some core values. We had a lot of disagreements. You, uh, you know, are part of a family business. There's a lot of friction in family businesses. I can write books and I can, you know, talk for hours for family businesses. And we had a lot of disagreements and a lot of arguments and a lot of different opinions about how we would go to where we want to go. But we never had a disagreement on, on the final destination. And I think that's what made us successful. I personally quit more than 10 times <laughs> because it, it becomes unbearable to work and, and you know, interact with your father uh, and your siblings, especially the father. But we, I was always going back to work because I knew and I could see the big picture and I say, okay, uh, let's not put our ego and the short term uh, perspective, but where we want to be in 15 years down the line. And it's also a fight who's going to conquer the castle. I mean, there is always this friction between families and that's why where a lot of families fail. And that's where, you know, the recipe for success is to have some common values that keep you going, even at times that are turbulent and difficult because I think there's no family business without them. Definitely. And I think because we don't have those barriers, because we are family, it's easier just to snap and, you know, butt your heads and want different things and, and react differently. Whereas when you're with colleagues that you're not related to, you have to, you know, always have that wall and be a little bit more yes, and, and um, also, you know, polite. Is, is managing two relationships. I mean, you don't only manage your, your father as your CEO. For example, yeah. I, I I can talk, I said that for hours on this, on this topic, but also you, you have to switch to, uh, managing your relationship as a, as a father and son. So it's two very complicated relationships that you need to manage. So you have the work environment that you need to operate in a certain format. And then during the weekends, you have a family party and you see someone you had a huge fight with the, the previous day about something at work and you need to manage that. And it's not an easy task. It's a very complicated task. So I think what... And what's the best, what are your tips then to overcome that? I, I stopped seeing my father for, you know, during weekends. <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> so you time. keep it just professional. Yes. Yeah, no, keep it so professional, you know, cool down over the weekend. And this is not something, you know, uh, you know, feeling hatred about my dad. It was a conscious decision that if we were working Monday to Friday together, and especially during the first years that I needed, you know, he had to accept me coming in, he wanted me to be in, but he, he didn't want to release control. And that, you know, his baby was being, uh, you know, hijacked by, by someone else. So all these, uh, you know, emotions coming out. On the one hand, you want your son or daughter to come in and, you know, have a succession plan. But at the same time, when you realize that you are sidelined and someone else, you know, steals the glory and gets into the spotlight, it's only normal human behavior that uh, you don't feel comfortable. And when, you know, your son starts getting credit about things that are happening and everybody says, ah, you know, and they forget about you, it's, it's a very tough, you know, psychological process that you have to go through. Um, and, you know, my conscious decision was that I told my dad, okay, Friday I see you, I see you again on Monday. If we're going to have this, uh, and then I would go out with my friends, talk about this, and or my girlfriend, and I would, at the time, or my wife, and I would say, you know, complain about my dad a lot, and then on Monday we go back to to normal. You have your de decompression time. Yeah, there, there's no other way. Otherwise, otherwise it, it keeps on, you know, culminating to mm. something bigger and bigger. We touched on this subject both, I think, with Michael Berardi and also the Harris Theoharos, and it's come up in this podcast before. I um, mean, it's definitely um, it, you know, it's, it's a very difficult, challenging, process, of course, for sure. Mm. But I think. At the same time, going through this process and managing it well and coming out of it, out of the storm, because now after 15 years, we both kind of settled. Uh, it, it makes, I, I, I'm sure they made me a better manager, uh, you know, much calmer, much easier to handle crises. Uh, I don't get stressed easily nowadays. I don't panic. I'm easy going with my stuff. And I think it was part of the, you know. You've also matured maybe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, you know, it didn't come easy, mm. you know, because on some occasions you see people who, uh, 
uh, you know, think that you're just the son who or daughter who comes into the business, finds everything, you know, a rosy path, and okay, you didn't achieve much. I think that I think that you need to prove yourself from starting from very low, climbing up the ladder, get the respect of everyone around the organization, and then start uh, leaving your own stigma and you know making things and proving that you can actually manage, not just maintain what your father or mother have you know they have built, but actually start growing the business, uh, creating a, an environment that everybody's happy to work. And, you know, use your people uh, well, because also keeping in mind that my father and, you know, that generation had a different approach about people. When you're talking about HR practices and the way you manage people, 40 or 50 years ago, it was a completely different story. Now we're talking about ESG and we're talking about sustainability and, you know, all of these things, they didn't grow up, you know, understanding these notions so as a new generation, you need to, add, you know, bring new, uh, new kind of principles and understand and, and establish a, the organization for the next 50 years. So that's, that was my plan. I mean, yes, I, I found a, a, a good businesses to work with, uh, but, you know, there were two roads, either to, to grow it and, and reestablish it as an organization or let it die. I mean, there was no, and I remember, again, my dad saying that, you know, I've built the runway at the airport. It's it's up to you whether you launch the the airplane or not. So I've I've done my part. I don't want anything to do more. I mean, I'm happy with what I've done. I am not ambitious anymore. It's either you. It's up to you. The the plane is there. Well, that's amazing. It's that's a bit rusty. It's that. a bit rusty. Okay, because I've done my my thing and I don't want more. It's up to you. If you manage to to lift the plane and you. Then, then you know you mm. you you get the benefit and and enjoy this ride. Otherwise, you know we close the business down and it's okay. Get a job as a lawyer because I was a lawyer and may, on many occasions my dad, when we would have an argument, said, "Ah, you shouldn't have come into the business. Go become a lawyer. You make more money and, and you're not you know stepping into my territory." And and these are the challenges and these are the you know issues. So where do you see yourself or see the company in twenty years time? In another 20 years. Yes, I mean, um, as I said, we, as an institution, we are clear in the sense that we don't want to become a university like any, every other university. We have a very clear vision of that, with clear strategy. Obviously, we want to grow our business. We have in, in the pipeline, uh, for example, an online program. So grow the capacity, not with the traditional only kind of a face-to-face, but, you know, adapt to the times as I said, COVID and all, everything has shown us that you need to give options to your Mm -hmm. clients, to the market. But not only that, in terms of the global market. So having a few online programs makes you a global player and it creates synergies without, you know, stretching your overheads and again, looking at your strengths, uh, what you can build on. The second second part is, I I believe there is a lot of prospect in, in the executive education, not only with our current programs in terms of um, short courses for the local market, but regionally. And I, I believe that we also can do something on a global scale with a global partner. It's one of our strategic goals. There is a gap in the market now. Uh, there are short uh, courses and you know providers of seminars or training. There are plenty around, but there is no global brand name uh, here in Cyprus. Mm-hmm. I think that's another prospect. And we want to keep on consolidating our place as the leading business school. Obviously, we want to grow our numbers, but the steady growth, a gradual growth, and something that will not jeopardize the quality and the relationship we have with our students. Because if you become mass production, and yeah. you lose what we identify Personal with. care, yeah. Yes, if we become a university, that's a different project. It's a completely different business. Because many people ask me, you know, why don't you become a university? And I say we don't want to become a university because we believe that we are not, you know, we, we represent... But everyone different. still leaves with a degree. Of course. You, yeah. All of our programs and all of our degrees mm-hmm. are university level. Mm-hmm. But becoming a university is a different story because, you know, you have departments, you have campuses, you have morning class. It's a different, it's a different mm-hmm. project. And I think it's not for us, at least 
you know, Not for now. the next, yes. Maybe you, maybe your kids. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> let, let, let them do something as well. Yeah. But uh, I think we keep on consolidating. We, we built our network, both in Cyprus and the region. I'd say again, because yes, we were based in Cyprus and we have very good contacts within Cyprus, but Cyprus is a tiny place. You need to look uh, overseas as well. Mm. Meaningful collaborations. I'm stressing the word meaningful and long-term collaborations. We never run any kind of short-term collaborations for for quick profit. Yeah. This was never a, we had a lot of temptations and a lot of a lot of uh, offers, but we never looked into short-term uh, solutions. Mm. And one good example is our collaboration with the University of West London that started 12 years ago, and it was very difficult to convince a, a university in the UK to trust us first of all but also to believe that we could generate sufficient number of students 10 years down the line. Because most universities, and I had negotiations with many universities in the UK, uh, they wanted you know, 100, 200 students the next day. The biggest problem we faced when we were having the negotiations was to show that you know, we are here for the long mm. term, believe, we, believe in us and walk with us step by step, and we're going to manage what we're going to manage. And we started with six students back in 2011, and now we have more than 180 students on UK programs, being one of the, their biggest and most wow. important partners, not only in terms of numbers, but also in terms of quality mm -hmm. of the students. And it's by far the most successful collaboration between any Cypriot institution and any UK university. So this is the kind of relationships we That's want amazing. to build. Yes. So you mentioned um, some things you don't like about Cyprus. And actually, it's one of my questions here. <laughs> Tell us some of the things that you do like. What do you like about Cyprus the most? Both in the both business-wise, but also um, just why should someone visit? What do you like about it personally? What are you most proud of being Cypriot? Oh, first of all, I'm, I'm very proud of being Cypriot. And to be honest, when I studied you know, in the UK, I became even more proud. Everyone and does, I, don't they? Yes, and I brought all my <laughs> friends here and I keep, you know... Uh, very good links with many friends around the world, and they've all, you know, visited Cyprus, loved Cyprus, and I'm very proud of of what you know Cyprus is doing. I mean, apart from the the kind of stereotype that life is easy, there is quality of life. You can see your friends easily, and you know, small things. But when you are working for for a demanding job, and to be able to you know leave your work and within five ten minutes to be with your friends in a nice setting, nice weather, without worrying too much about the logistics, I think makes your life much easier. It's obviously, it's a nice place to have your family. It's still pretty safe. Okay, it's not the same as it was 30 years ago, but it's still pretty safe. It's still easy for the kids to socialize. Um, you have this kind of community that supports you, whether it's your family, your friends, everybody is around. The weather is something, of course, the, the tourists love. The quality of the service has improved a lot, whether it's restaurants or bars. I remember when we were growing up, we were always impressed to go to London or Athens for the sake of, you know, having a nice dinner or going out. Yes, still, these, this, you know, more kind of uh, metropolitan cities are, are nice to go and visit, and I, I love visiting. But Cyprus has improved a lot in terms of the quality of the service, in terms of the, the multicultural environment. I grew up in, a, in an environment that... You would see a foreigner and you would spot them out. Nowadays, it's, it's a completely different story. And the same goes with your work environment. I mean, you have colleagues from all around the world and everybody brings something different. And it, it improves the culture. It improves, it makes us more open-minded. We're still going to be a tiny place, an island. And we're still going to have some, you know, small island syndromes. Okay. And that's for sure that will never change. Uh, but at the same time, we came a long way in interacting, learning from from people from different cultures. And, uh, you know, I love Cyprus. I'm very happy. I, I've never thought of living anywhere else, both because my business is here, but because I love I love uh, my, my, my lifestyle. Uh, but at the same time, I love traveling. And I, I feel Cyprus is a great place. But, the, you know, once or twice a month. So it's come out of the pond. Yes. It, it, it's so important, not only not only because of, of, of uh, you know, going out, but also seeing the trends, you know, walking in a street in London or New York or Paris. Just developing. Developing. And, and, and on many occasions I go to conferences, not for the sake of the conference, but for the networking events, for having a bit of time on my own, waking up, having breakfast on my own, monitoring people, 
Yeah, you know, I, I, I always write down ideas when I'm traveling because it's, it's kind of getting out of the bubble, getting out of the comfort zone and, and start, you know, spending some time on my own, being more creative than I'm, I am at the office. So everything, kind of the package of living in Cyprus, you know, traveling, interacting with uh, people from all uh, nationalities, I think makes you more complete. Mm. Uh, at the same time, you know, I, there are friends of mine who, you know, don't like the small place and they would love to, to live in a, in a much busier because, you know, you don't have privacy. That's one of the things I don't like. You know, everybody knows one another, especially if you're connected to many people, you go out, you know, you have to kind of take care of your profile because you are a business person, you have students, you have colleagues, you cannot be fully as you want to be. Uh, on, on many occasions. But I think you find your balance. You find your balance. I think it gets easier, I think, as you get older. Angles, I could chat to you for ages because we've got so many, always so many things to talk about. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question before we go to the bonus question. And that is, and I love asking this question to everyone, tell us a favourite quote. I mean, you read a lot, you study a lot. Tell us one of your favourite quotes. Okay, uh, uh, you know, it comes from... As I said, the Theodore Levy, the one that I gave before, you know, the future comes, mm-hmm. you know, belongs to to those who see possibilities before they become obvious. But my kind of lifestyle and my kind of style of approaching things, a Chinese proverb which says that don't live for tomorrow, something you can do today. And this has been my my whole life. My friends make fun of me because I'm super organized and I plan my trips way ahead and I plan my restaurant bookings and I plan my... But, you know, I manage a lot of different affairs because apart from CIM, I'm a board member. To yeah, well, you're active. That's how you and manage the, to the fit it all in. the only way I manage things is to be able to do things today. I never leave things for tomorrow. And this has been my kind of guiding principle. Sometimes, you know, it can be OCD or, or you know, waking up and replying an email at 11 or 12 or 2 o'clock in the morning. But nowadays, I have, I would say, a very balanced approach to life. I don't work more than seven or eight hours a day and I see my friends and I play football and I run and I go out exactly because I put this in practice that I do things as they come. I try to close my my open issues as soon as possible and not delay uh, taking decisions or delay acting because, you know, I need more and more time. Many people are not responsive and, you know, when people tell me, you know, you respond too quickly to your emails, I say, but I thought that everybody should be like this. I mean, I'm not the person who doesn't have emails to reply to, but I always respond within one or two hours because that's my kind of approach. Well, some people have that as a rule and it works for it, different people. It works yeah. very well for me. And yeah. I think, you know, more people should do that because it would make business easier because on some occasions, you know, you have to send 10 reminders to get a reply. And this is something I don't like in the business world. Oh, very frustrating. Yes, definitely. Okay. Pick. Okay, bonus drum question. roll, drum roll. Should I read it to you? <laughs> you read it to me. Let's see. What have you got? So sometimes the, the team writes, he wrote it, but not, not here. Are you an introvert or extrovert? And how has either of these helped you in your life? Oh, I'm extrovert 100%. Really? I say that I can be out of the, of the house 365 days. My, my wife is not very happy on that. She complains that I go out a lot and I... I find excuses to go to events, but uh, definitely I'm a social, you know. Yeah, social you get being. your energy from people. For sure. Um, as I said, on some occasions when traveling, I like to be on my own, but in general, I don't. I want to have a crowd to interact, to to laugh, to uh, network, whether it's business or socially. So 100% I'm extrovert, and this has helped me a lot. Uh, because I've never been shy in introducing myself, in talking about my business, and it has generated a, a lot of business. It has made me new friends. I would uh, go abroad and, uh, you know, if I'm on my own traveling, I would make friends on the plane. I would make friends at the hotel. I would make friends everywhere. And uh, I think this is this is me. This is not something I'm pretending to be. This is yeah. me. And I have developed this into also helping my business. Yeah. Well, it's definitely a good skill, that's for sure throwing this in our pile here. Thank you so much. It's so interesting. And I have no doubt that all the listeners would have gained something today from listening to you. So I wish you all the best and every success to you, your family. Thank you for having me. And to many, many more years. A very good tourist season. Thank (laughs) you so much. Thank you. you Yes. It's it's crucial for all of us. Reopening now. It's crucial for all of us. You know, 
uh, for all the uh, you know Cypriot economy. And yeah. uh, thank you so much for you know very very uh, nice conversation. It's always a pleasure to be. Always a pleasure. Thank you.